Just shot me. Yeah. And here we are. Everybody, in case you don't know who this is, this is Robin Pearson, and I dare say he is the greatest podcaster of all time. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's incredible. Like, how did you do it? This, it's such a monumental task. I, like, how long have you been doing this? He does the History of Byzantium podcast. I think it's been going since 2013. Is that what I read? Yeah, and I, I, I think I started it 2012. So, yeah. So 10 what, years? What? Are you still going? Because, <laughs> like, I'm still in the... I'm, like, not even at the first crusade yet. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Still going. Still going. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's incredible. And you know what else is amazing as well? This is just something that needs to be put on the record. I think you're the greatest storyteller of all time. <laughs> I mean, you're starting the interview at a very high bar now. Can only go downhill from here. Well, I mean, and I should yeah. say, obviously, that the Byzantines are giving me the stories to tell, so I can't, I can't claim to have made them up. Yeah, but I've heard other people's history podcasts before, and uh, let's just say I, uh, I, I have not listened to hundreds of episodes of them. Let's put it that way. It's amazing. I think you have a natural knack for storytelling. Do you think you do? That's very kind of you to say i mean uh, sadly i am very much the apple falling from the tree so my mom like writes local history books and my dad was an actor who kind of specialized in one-man shows where he would kind of tell stories so yeah i very much sort of got it from them i guess um yes yes but you know my what i always try to do is to imagine you know, I, I research an episode in the week and then I write it immediately. I don't read a hundred years of history and then start writing so that I'm always saying, well, what did I just find out that you don't know? Mm. Um, and so I'm always explaining it to myself from last week, if you see what I mean. Uh, um, so you're so telling that, yourself the story. Exactly. Um, and so I think I am the listener. You know what I mean? I, I loved history podcasts, you know, before I started and, there were some like Mike Duncan's History of Rome, which obviously was my inspiration, which I loved. And I loved the way he did that. He would say, now, remember last week we were talking about this. Well, now this is going to happen. And I, I always was very struck by that because when you read a history book, sometimes they're great, but often you forget what happened 100 pages ago because there's so oh, yeah. much to take in. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what I've always aimed to do is to say, I know you love this podcast, but you probably don't remember what I said six months ago. So let me remind you. <laughs> and then I think that really helps people kind of stay engaged. Um, you know, I can't guarantee it's going to work. It's nice to hear it works for some people, but that's always my goal is just, if I think someone might have forgotten this, I need to remind them and keep those bits of information coming back. Mm. And you want that. Like it's, 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 a, it's a, a great little trick that you've come across. Because just for anybody who doesn't know, I, I do highly recommend that you start listening to this podcast because it's just, it's the greatest car companion I've ever had. Um, and like, I, I, I've been thinking about it so much and it's like, so you're up to a decade now because this is the other thing that keeps coming through my head every time I think about it. So it's like, how did he not give up on it? <laughs> <laughs> you know it's going as long as the byzantine history actually is going it, it's just an epic amount of effort that's the other thing that i think is just mm. so incredible about what you've done there is just, like i really feel like people that built byzantine monasteries put in less work than you did <laughs> <laughs> well i mean the nice thing because talking to you you know what it's like when you're working independently and online yeah you're you're often doing lots of work and the content isn't visible so kind of you know it the reason it's taken me so long is obviously there are long periods of silence i'm not putting out an episode every week but obviously i'm working and reading and researching and it all just takes time yeah, um, yeah. the reason i haven't given up is because people keep giving me money um <laughs> you know you know as as again as you'll have found you reach a certain point where you have to either quit and get a real job or make this work. And mm. so I kept having, you know, sort of fundraising sales every year and a half or so. And people kept putting in enough money to keep me going until, uh, you know, podcasting started to get the kind of advertising revenue that can sort of support 
um, listener donation. So that has really kept me going. And uh, now I can do it full time as a living, which is amazing. Well, if, if you, is it the only thing that's really pushing you to do it is the fact that like, it's just become your livelihood because there's also just this level of respect, I'd say, that you give to the narrative. Like, I don't know. It just really feels like you've immersed yourself in that world, or at least that's the impression that comes off. Yeah. No, obviously I, I, I really enjoy the job that that keeps me going and yeah definitely you feel I feel a sense of ownership of the Byzantines which obviously I don't have but <laughs> you feel a sense of I've been telling their story and I need to keep telling their story and I need to respect it it's interesting how that comes across um yeah I I, I, I it, it comes and goes that, that feeling of like am I on their side or am I just an observer or you know do I care? Because obviously I get a lot of messages from people when things go badly and people are invested. Yes. And I always say it's like they're following their sports team. Yes. Know? It's like, oh, I can't believe this happened. Like, oh, you know, I can't wait till the next guy comes in and makes things better. And, um, you know, obviously that that feeling is in me, though it obviously it changes over the years. The more the more immersed you get, the more complicated it gets. But yeah, no, I, that respect is definitely there. Right. Because do you actually then feel as you get closer and closer to 1453 is it do you feel a sense of impending dread because i've got to tell you right now if i'm being perfectly honest just coming up to the first crusade it, it now it's actually the same thing as what you're saying like I've, I've severely reduced how much i listen to your podcast because it actually is just like an emotional toll on me it, you know what you've done you've done you, never-ending story in a podcast form it's incredible like i feel like that little boy crying when the horse drowns in the mud or whatever it is <laughs> uh that's brilliant i mean it's just it's really interesting because i get a lot of messages like that um uh from people and, and kind of in the nicest possible way saying i'm gonna stop listening <laughs> and you're like great yeah. that's not what yeah, i want to hear yeah. but yeah, yeah but yeah um do you feel that? That's what I'm wondering. No, um, I slightly feel the dread of people stop stopping listening. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know any of the details of the so 1204 Constantinople is sacked by the Fourth Crusade, and I know the gist of what happens from there till 1453, but I don't know any of the details. So from my point of view, it's like I'm excited to find out, and I'm interested, and mm. you know, I've I've become really interested in different bits of history. So the fact that they Romans won't be a superpower anymore. It doesn't bother me. Um, but I, I do get that sense that people will be less interested, that, that ultimately um, the minutia is less interesting to people than the big dramatic battle stories. So yeah, it, it, it may be I see people drifting away and that's sad, but I don't think I will be less interested in the history. Right, because look, I'm not saying I'm getting less interested in it. It's just the emotional tax of it. But actually, when I skip forward to the Paleogolian, mm -hmm. is, is that how it's said? Paleologan, I, I guess. Paleologan. Yeah. Oh. So many syllables. Um, <laughs> that, 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 when you go into that, no, actually, the minutia that you're talking about is fascinating. It's actually mm. more fascinating the more it constricts, I find, mm. anyway. It's yeah, kind of just I don't know. Like you just, it's, it, you feel like you're rooting for an underdog, and I think that you mentioned this once when you were talking about the history of Rome podcast as opposed to yours. That's how you feel like when you're re uh, listening to the history of the Byzantine Empire. It just it feels like one of those crap soccer teams in the English league <laughs> that you know isn't Arsenal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely fighting against relegation every single year. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it definitely feels like that. It feels like you go from this gigantic superpower that conquers everything to being almost like a modern nation state that's kind of fighting to survive. And yeah, it really does go from a point where you think they should be wiped out and then 500 years later, they're still there fighting. So yeah, it, that is a fun part of the story. And I think we all like an underdog story. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it does yeah. engage you emotionally and... Um, Yes, yes. Yes, I mean, we're about to become real 
real underdogs uh, <laughs> <laughs> without the kind of comeback story i mean there, you know there, there's always a little comeback isn't there so even after the fourth crusade you know byzantine forces will retake the city eventually so there's there are always little happy moments um yes but yeah no i, I mean i think uh I think it will be interesting to see what happens um, with people's interest. Because something other people warned me about was that um, Greek, modern Greek and Turkish people will start to, uh, you know, abuse each other on social media when I get closer and closer to the modern day. <laughs> um, you know, and the history starts to mean more to people, you know, um, because obviously big Roman Empire stuff doesn't really affect people today. But when the Turkish, you know modern nation state starts to come into view and the greek one too then that gets much more personal yeah i didn't even think about that well, yeah to get ready for that are you yeah. um are you do, do you feel like when you're doing it you're kind of only interested in the historical fact of it or does it kind of because this is the other thing and maybe it's just your telling of it but i also think from the books that i'm reading as well even the really dry books, like I'm reading one at the moment called like The Economy of the Byzantine Empire or something like that. Even then, it kind of had, it, 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 even that kind of captures your imagination, at least for me anyway. Do you feel like that that's what's happening when you're reciting this historical stuff? Like you sit there and you're just like, I wonder what it would have been like to have been a milkmaid. Like <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, I, I think... The weird thing with Byzantium is how little we know. We obviously have this like written history that goes through the whole period, which enables us to talk about it at all. But because Turkey is now, um, you know, a Muslim state and and like a a nation state for Turkish people and not for Byzantine people, we have this big gap. There's there's very few bits of writing. There's very few records of things. So the book you're reading about the economy even that has a certain kind of mystery of, of them piecing mm. things together from tiny bits of evidence. Mm, mm. So that it, it's always intriguing because it kind of encourages your imagination more to mm. kind of fill the gaps left mm. between these tiny little morsels of what we do know. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I feel very fired up by that. Like the, the period where um, the Arab, the Arab um, empire, the Umayyads and the Abbasids are raiding eastern anatolia every year to me that's like um you know in my imagination that's like watching lost or the walking dead or something like this kind of landscape where terrible things can happen and there's points of safety to reach and like mm. but we don't we know nothing about it because nobody in constantinople was going to write about this horrible thing happening every year and what the poor people were doing so they just kind of gloss over it so you're left with this very dramatic sort of wild west landscape but we know nothing about so yeah, yeah that it, the whole thing fires my imagination well what about like the, is the archaeological evidence good or like does just turkey not fund it and they're not interested in it so i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily um blame them directly but obviously there is an element of that where it's not their history so there's less um tourist demand like let's dig this up it'll be great you know it'll become some great site um but i think archaeology in general struggles to find funding so um when something is going to get funding it has to be um something relevant something exciting something whatever and byzantium is not that to people um because it's nobody's home archaeology really um but do so, you feel like, because you've been doing it for 10 mm, years, do you feel mm, like interest, of, it's, I, I, it's weird because you have a skewed view of it because there's so many people telling you that they're interested in it. Do you feel like it's become more or less interesting as time? I, I think there's been a growth and I think that's the internet because I think um, people are looking for content. And uh, I imagine you came through the history of Rome or through Roman history towards this. Um, no, and actually, I, you know what? I'll, I'll let you finish, right. but I'll tell you that because that, that might interest you a lot, but sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, so I, I'm guessing most people come through that. And so I think with the growth of YouTube and podcasting and other things online, Byzantium keeps getting more attention and people become more aware of it because you kind of do all the big Roman stories and then you want more and you think, oh, there's this whole thing I haven't heard about. And so, yeah, it seems to me to be growing in interest. 
Uh, before I just tell you that, why do mm. you think there was no interest in the Byzantine era? Because Anthony Caldellas, is that the guy you keep recommending? I've read a couple of his books now. Yeah. Mm, yeah. You know how he's kind of, it seems like he's almost saying that uh, it's almost as if like a thousand years of Roman history was just wiped off the history books. Yeah. I mean, it's a really, it's a really odd one now when you, when you're reading history and you're like, how did this get ignored? But um, I think it's because when Western Europe starts to grow and dominate its surrounding areas and reconnect with its classical past, um, there was a sense that we want all this Roman stuff, all the classical Roman stuff, the Julius Caesar and the Cicero, to be our history. Um, and we really take pride in that. And so when someone says, well, you know, they carried on and there's a thousand years of, um, you know, in Greek, um, Christian, you know, ideas and philosophy, it just, it doesn't fit that we don't mm. want all that because we've got our own, um, you know, Catholic Christianity that kind of has superseded that in their mind. So that, that disconnect happens where it's like, well, let's just say that's not really the same thing. And then obviously the, the Turks in Turkey, because of their, Islamic civilization don't want to know about this Christian past on their land necessarily. Um, and so, yeah, you end up with, well, who is remembering the Byzantines as important as, as their history, which obviously the Greeks, the modern nation of Greece does. But again, because tourism is coming from the West, they tend to advertise their classical past um, and ignore their whole medieval period, at least, you know, in terms of sort of the major tourist sites yeah there are Greek, yeah. there are greek people who've been very annoyed at me for implying <laughs> that they don't promote byzantium but obviously okay. it's not something you see in in the tourist books in the same way that the parthenon is oh yeah i'd love to ask you about what you thought about the sites that you visited but uh mm. just just fyi the way that i yeah. came across your podcast was I, I just finished doing a show about julius caesar and i don't know i was really into it as a kid uh it kind of, I don't know, I guess this is what you were saying, like it just emerged in front of the internet. And then I just started talking to all of the uh, learned men I know in my life, like my lawyer. And we've got a former prime minister here, Kevin Rudd. Uh, I interview him a lot and I talk to him about it. And uh, there was other people as well, like just a couple of academics and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's like all these very educated dudes that are like in their 60s. You bring up Byz Byzantium, and they say the same thing every time. They're like, they're still dirty that Constantinople was taken. It's like, it was like 650 years ago. You weren't born. Like, I, I, <laughs> but they're like, they're like viscerally angry about it when, oh, when wow. you bring it yeah. up. It's, it's, it's a thing that I've noticed people that seem to uh, know it, like things about history, they seem mm. to be really attached to the idea of the Byzantine Empire. And they always say the same thing as well. And I'm in the same camp now. So it's like, it's way more interesting than the Roman era, way more interesting. And just like, for some reason, you feel some, I don't know, anyway, I feel more personal attachment to it than I do Rome. I think a lot of it is credit to you, but I don't know, that's, that's the general makeup of what I'm getting here. Yeah, it's really interesting. I, I think, obviously, they are closer to us than the the ancient Romans, and they they suffer a lot. They go through a lot, you know, uh, where they are under dire threat. And so I think there is a sense that they didn't get enough help uh, <laughs> and assistance <laughs> uh, from, you know, most of us, most of our ancestors, if they are Western European, you know, basically didn't help and helped bring them down. So I think there is that sense of like, there's an uh, ungratitude in, in Western Europeans, and it goes on to um, sort of forgetting Byzantine history altogether. But that's really interesting. Yeah. There was this, uh, speaking of, there's this book that I've been obsessed with. You've probably read it, or uh, I can't remember the author of it, but it was like Venice and Byzantium, like a diplomatic history or something like that. Yeah. You read yeah. that? Yeah. Thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's David Nickel, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a really interesting one. And um, 
there's, there's a whole thing with Venice, you know, that Venice is, is very much like a modern, um, you know, global company that they, the whole state is designed around uh, making money. And that was quite unusual in medieval states because they kind of lived off the land. And so Venice operates sort of like Amazon today or something, you know, pushing to open up markets and pushing against Constantinople. And in a way, Constantinople has a much more ancient mindset that, you know, for you know, trading, making money, that's, that's a bit crass. And I don't think they see the threat from Venice coming um, until it's too late, really. And um, yeah, so they, they have a fraught diplomatic history uh, as a result. And um, we may be seeing that again today, you know, when <clears throat> companies like Amazon push against states like China and, you know, who gives way to who in terms of allowing access to markets and so on. Yeah. So do you think that that was, uh, that, that Venice's role was a, a, a large part of the fall of Byzantium? I mean, literally, yes, because they brought the Fourth Crusade to Constantinople, I think, um, but that, that could have been a different um, fleet. I think Venice are a representative of the West, the, the Latin West, you know, Western Europe were growing in a different direction. And I think this is part of the story is that they didn't have to deal with the threats that Byzantium did in part because Byzantium dealt with them for them. For them yeah. um, so Western Europe was developing into, you know, into the start of the modern world where making money and moving away from the land and creating capital was becoming a thing. And Byzantium didn't really have that, those um, philosophies, those ideas, because it didn't need to, because it had big farmland, tax the farmland, no problem. And so Venice are, Venice and the Normans who lived in Italy are, are kind of the closest powers to Byzantium who bring this kind of acquisitive capitalism and eventually kind of a form of colonialism um, where they sort of take over bits of Byzantium, which obviously you know, Byzantium had done before. Um, but yeah, you know, they're, they're kind of bringing a new philosophy and a new energy that Byzantium doesn't have and Byzantium doesn't really know how to deal with them, but it takes Byzantium a long time to deal with new ideas. So if they'd survived, they would have eventually found a way to deal with Venice and kind of um, keep them out, but they didn't. So sadly, <laughs> the Fourth <laughs> Crusade happened, yeah. Um, yeah, it's really you, interesting you say yeah. that. Like there's just something that always rattled in my mind about that book and you're gonna to have to forgive me. I, I really do forget all the names, but I do remember mm. one of the later Byzantine emperors having some kind of uh, correspondence with one of the doges. And mm. I don't know, you got this sense that the emperor just couldn't understand where the Venetian doge was coming from. Like it was all just like brought back into like accounting of just being like, we predicted, we, we think that this castle's worth this much. And like, you know, this, I don't know, this island is worth this much or whatever. Mm. And his correspondence over and over was kind of just like, why are you talking like that? Like he couldn't, mm. that always, in fact, if out of everything, that's the thing that always just makes me pause for thought. It, it almost seems like there was like a psychological shift in Europe that happened. And as you're kind of explaining now, it seems like just the Byzantines kind of just represented, I don't know, I guess like the medieval world and the medieval way of thinking. And that was mm. just the hostile yeah. takeover. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the Latin West was not um, a very centralized place in, in medieval times. So if you were rich and you got yourself a castle, to some extent, people couldn't, move you if you had enough food stored up and you even if you pissed loads of people off yeah. as long as you stayed behind your walls you know so people um you'll you'll discover this when you listen to the first crusade there's lots of people there who are sort of you know entrepreneurs i guess who are saying if i can just get enough men and enough money i can take that castle and then that castle will be mine and i will be twice as rich and so on so you've got that yeah that acquisitive mindset over in Byzantium, it's the opposite. It's a very centralized state. So you go, well, I could take that castle, but who am I going to anger if I do? Because ultimately, the emperor has all the power. And he has all the power because of taxation. So it's weird where Byzantium 
is both old and modern where mm. because the centralized tax system means ultimately the emperor can always pay more men than you can to fight so people deliberately don't do that kind of castle building and that's kind of self aggrandizement because they're afraid the emperor's going to hire 50,000 men march down and, and wipe you out mm. so it's a clash of cultures so the exactly what you're describing the venetians are going we want this particular piece of land and the romans would say well that that land is less important than our ultimate relationship which is you you are on the payroll you do what you're told or else there'll be consequences and the venetians thinking much more in a modern way that each p each acquisition is adding up in my balance book so yeah it, it's it's just a clash and it might not have ended in byzantium being destroyed but um it just did that that's one of those weird things if byzantium had survived the fourth crusade they probably would have eventually made a comeback just because they have more people they have more land you know it's just the way things work out you know it's uh mm. that's the funny thing about history it's not nothing's inevitable mm, mm, mm. yeah tell me about it <laughs> so you've been doing these tours for a long time mm. I assume. well You're we've enjoying only them. done oh yeah so these are tours around turkey for um to see the byzantine sites yeah. for anyone who doesn't know Sorry um no, well, we've only done three because we did two in 2019 and then two years of COVID. And then, so we did one earlier this year um, and hope to do more next year. And um, yeah, they're, they're so much fun. I mean, it's just uh, fantastic for me because my Turkish tour guide does all the hard work of booking hotels and <laughs> coaches and things. And I just get to turn up and talk about Byzantium. Um, Where? But yeah, I mean, it's, 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 fantastic to take people to the sites in Istanbul and to recreate things and you know sometimes things aren't fully standing anymore but you you know where things were and um yeah and then we get we get to go out to Ephesus and Cappadocia and places um where there are amazing things to see so yeah they're really fun okay so you've been to Constantinople Cappadocia what was the mm. other one that you went to Istanbul? Ephesus Ephesus mm. so these are the these are the sites that you go to on your tour uh, those are the three main ones at the moment. Yeah, but we're looking into yeah. other places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So are, are the other two that I barely know about, but like Cappadocia mm. and stuff, are they, you think that they're like just as impressive as Istanbul or? Yeah, in different ways. So um, you probably, if you Google Cappadocia, you will go, oh yeah, I've seen that. It's like a landscape that looks kind of like the moon and there are usually hot air balloons going over the top of it. Oh yeah. Um, every yeah. Instagram girl's photo. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. that's exactly it <laughs> and you said bull they love it both oh uh, yeah definitely yeah. but yeah i mean cappadocia you can take anyone you can take your partner who's not interested in history at all and they'll love it because it's unlike anywhere else um and uh, basically it's volcanic rock that you can dig into like you can literally dig in with your hand if you want and make an impression in it and so people have burrowed in and built all these caves and they were there before the romans came but obviously during the byzantine period people hid in them to avoid the Arab raids. Mm. So it's an amazing thing to see. And then they, they painted them like, so we'll dig, dig out an area and that'll be a church. And then they paint it exactly like a, a Constantinopolitan church. Oh, wow. And that stuff is still there. So oh, like actual churches, uh, Byzantine churches have mostly been knocked down and turned into mosques. Whereas these, yeah, these cave churches are still there. Um, so that, yeah, that is really cool. So you can Google that and they, they look amazing. What, like the paints preserved and everything in there? Yeah. Um, so th this amazing. is from, yeah, sort of 10, 1100. And because they are sheltered from the rain um, by all oh, these loads of rock above them, they haven't worn off. Obviously they are, you know, there are places where they're very worn, but some of them are in amazing condition, um, you know, and now they're being looked after. So that's really great to see. Um, Ephesus is a bit like going to Pompeii like it's a ruin of the classical Roman city and the buildings are all still there you know some have fallen down some haven't um and then you kind of you see Byzantine history in action because then on a hill next to the classical city is where the Byzantines moved to avoid the Arabs and the Turks and you can see the ruins of their mm. sort of you know settlements so yeah so those are really fun um to go to as well yeah and it sounds like they're extremely popular with your fan base yeah, I mean, the people who come on the tours uh, are really happy to be there. And yeah. um, it feels like a place like maybe maybe people have been to Rome before 
um, have been to Pompeii before if they've you know done some traveling, but they haven't been to to Turkey in the same way. So yeah, it's really nice. Great. It does sound like a, yeah, it, it it was it was an amazing idea. Like all the ideas that you've come up with in your podcast in terms of just uh, I don't know fundraising, uh, these guided tours, all this kind of it's it's like really interesting internet entrepreneurship. Like I have the most basic model ever of just like buy my face on a shirt. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> You've just come up with all of these ingenious, like great <laughs> value ads. Well, that's yeah, that's very real. kind of you. I mean, I responded to people. Obviously, you know, I, I there were other ideas I had, but this was the one people were really interested in. Yeah. And you know, it it fits the show very well. Obviously, to go and see the places you're hearing about. Doesn't. Um, but like, yeah, I. I it's an interesting one in terms of like making your internet, you know, business or your, what your model work, because I, what I followed was my own feeling. Like, I think always I've tried to keep in mind that I'm the fan I'm trying to attract or I'm the fan I'm speaking to. Like we were talking about earlier. And sense. that, like, I didn't know that was going to work because you, and you suddenly discover, Oh, I, you know, actually there are a lot of people, in the world who think and feel similarly to you about their hobbies or, or whatever. Um, so the people I meet on tour often, it's like, oh, he's he's a bit like me, or oh, he seems like my friend so and so. Like they they feel familiar because they're kind of people who are on your wavelength and and you know you have that kind of connection. But um, yeah, that's so I yeah, I mean so I, I mean you may find that with you know your audience that there are people who feel just like you and say to you like, ah, you know, that's exactly what I was thinking. And you, it's a nice connection to have, but you know, so I, I went to the audience directly and said, can you pay me for this next episode? And lots of people said, you can't charge for podcasts and I don't like you and blah, blah, blah. But I was just going on the basis that if Mike Duncan from the history of Rome had said, I can't keep going without money. Can you give me money? I'd have given him money. So I just thought, I don't want to force you to buy a t-shirt or a mug if you don't want one if you just want to give me money, I'll give you more podcasts. And I mean, there's, you know, the, some people are like, oh, I want the t-shirt, but <laughs> I just went with what I would want, which is just, here's the money, keep giving me more content. So that's that's what's worked so far. Um, that's incredible because I cannot, uh, we're about to run out of time, but uh, like, I cannot believe that you, of anyone on the internet, <laughs> would get hate. It's just incredible. <laughs> you're, like, you're the most charming, easygoing British <laughs> man it's it's incredible like that's the whole thing like your pedigree is basically bbc radio announcers just like <laughs> and 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 there's still people that are giving you shit on the net i, mean, I really that. don't understand it i, I like and yeah. the fact that you're always just so nice to your audience that's <laughs> a, a, a complete foreign concept to me i just don't <laughs> make money and like and and you on the other hand, are just like, just so grateful all the time to your audience. I just assumed that you were just in like the most happy, strange little ecosystem that it was by itself. This, you know, just, just this bubble that was isolated from the rest of the swill. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you're very kind to me. I really appreciate it. And, um, you know, like, like anyone, you, you know, it's because you don't know me personally. That's why you think I'm so nice. But um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll say this. You put up a good act. I'll give you that. <laughs> that was very kind. Well, this is the weird thing is, so before I did this, uh, I was um, podcasting about American TV shows and I, I was just as polite, you know, as I am now, but I was very opinionated. You know, I was like, this is no good. This is terrible writing, et cetera, et cetera. And that was much more, uh, you know, we would say Marmite in the UK, you would say Vegemite, you know, whatever. People would be like, I, I can't listen to you like you're shitting on my favorite TV show and so I kind of learned from that like that's maybe not my style I'm too passionate about TV whereas with the Romans I have this more detached you know narrator thing and people tend to be yeah as you say they, they I do tend to live in a pocket without much hate but as soon okay. as you charge as soon as you charge people money that the people will object so yeah. right 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 but that's, that's like the point. only pushback that you've gotten so was there any, any moments ever where people, like you just get some, uh, I don't know, little subreddit that is, uh, <laughs> you know, out for your blood because you did no. announce a name wrong or something like that? Uh, 
I mean, I get messages about that, definitely. And I mean, the, the biggest mistakes I've made are all about Christian theology, that I, I, you know, I'm not specific enough and people will message me going, you know, what you're saying is not technically correct. And uh-huh. obviously the majority of the audience don't know that, but yeah. I appreciate that, that I, that's not my area of expertise, so I do make mistakes. Um, oh, yeah. Massive. But yeah, pr- pronunciations bother everyone. If you get it wrong, <laughs> it bothers me when I hear it. It's someone saying something wrong. So you, you can't help that. Um, it just happens. You know what I've, uh, you know what I've been very curious about. Mm. Seeing as you've been doing this for so long, mm. how's your uh, concept of what Byzantium is? How's that changed from like now to, I mean, then to now? <laughs> <laughs> In what way are you are you thinking? I don't know. It's just like, look, before, before I started looking into any of this whatsoever, my concept of, of what Byzantium was was that mosaic of Emperor Justinian, and that was it. Mm. Yeah. And now I sit there and I think, you know what? This is kind of the... As you were just saying before, it's it's sort of the forerunner to like what a modern state is. Like it's just this mm. incredibly sophisticated bureaucratic machine. I feel like it was just like a deliberate slur to because uh, the other thing that I that, that really freaks me out and I get very conspiratorial about it is the idea that. You know, you read anything like that's like a Koch brother think tank, like the Cato Institute or something like that. They'll always be talking about how we need to go back to, I don't know, like uh, late Republic Rome or uh, the other one is always that we need to go back to uh, Enlightenment principles, right? And then you read what the Enlightenment era was saying about the Byzantine Empire and it's just nothing but baseless trashing of it, reducing it to this just like... Uh, orthodox tyranny um Mm. and then i just started thinking about it and i was like look really all i really knew about the byzantine empire before all of that was that was the word byzantine like the the this this overly bureaucratic Mm. lines and lines of red tape no one really knows how it works it just kind of just keeps chugging along until it just falls apart by its own weight Right. And uh, mm. I don't know. Now that I look at it, I think it's kind of the exact opposite of what it was. It was an unbelievably efficient state during the time of the Dark Ages. I always think that it's just such an epic idea, right? Just the idea that there's just this one shining beacon of civilization as the rest of Europe descends into like darkness and chaos for like a thousand years. And then there's just this one city kind of like holding what made Rome work together against like, you know, I don't know, climate change, plagues, endless hordes of barbarians. It's, I don't know. I just feel like I just, we just owe the Byzantine empire, like the fact that we can even talk in Australia and Britain at the same time. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's an interesting one. Um, Yeah. It's difficult. I suppose. Um, my answer is sort of more complicated i think i think in a way what you just said is is how i feel which is you can't have you can't understand the modern world without byzantium um you know i i always i try to sort of you know because obviously someone who's not interested in history i have to say something kind of bold but i always say well you can't really understand the first world war or the cold war or the mafia or like, um, you know, Islamic State, uh, all these things that are very modern um, without Byzantium. Um, You know, why does Russia, why is Russia an Orthodox country and not a Catholic one? And why does that make Russians feel like they're not a part of Western Europe and they never will be? And, you know, we have this conflict, Um, you know, that the roots go back to Byzantium. Why is the Balkans so full of different people who all, you know have had these terrible conflicts that sort of sparked the first world war why does the mafia sort of operate in the south of italy and not the north these these all go back to byzantium and so that yeah my sense is that it has a big impact on the world that isn't sort of fully understood um 
I don't know if I'd give the Byzantines credit <laughs> uh, for those things. Like I think they did, there was a lot of unintended consequences. I think you're right, they, it's amazing that they survived a period where a lot of organized states disappeared. But um, where it gets complicated is like their, their tax system was very efficient compared to all the other tax systems. But when you look into the individual cases we have, it's deeply, you know, by our standards, deeply corrupt and kind yeah, of but like you can give them um, some slack for it. Sure. Of course you can. <laughs> have a telephone, you know, <laughs> exactly. So, no, you're right. So it's that thing where it's like, you know, it's very, it's a very interesting, powerful state and it, its ability to extract wealth is impressive. But then you do also see down the ground kind of how is that experienced by the individual or the group or, you know, and uh, it can be very unpleasant, uh, you know. Is it unpleasant? Uh, because this is what I, I don't know, like <laughs> it seems like from what I'm gathering, as again, like what you're saying, very skinny mm. evidence from it, but it really seems like, dude, Dark Ages Europe, sign me up as a citizen of New Rome any day. <laughs> like even during like the Arab raids, it seems like being on the front line would be better than being in Britain. I, I suppose it's... Um, what you find when, when we can get a little glimpse into Byzantine society is uh, how important your personal relationships are. Um, so if you are connected to the local rich landowner, then he can offer you some protection. If you are connected to anyone who works in Constantinople, they can offer you protection. If you don't have those connections, you are kind of dependent on the whims of the people who are the local bigwigs. Um, so that's a very precarious situation. Like sometimes we find places that really didn't attract much, you know, big corruption. Uh, and so people probably existed in farming communities undisturbed by central authority. And then in other places you find someone who's terribly corrupt and got away with stuff and people's homes got taken or, you know, or worse. So, you know, and I guess that happens everywhere. Um, but it, there's something uh there's something about the power of the state that can be scary you know if the emperor can order something to happen and everyone will just go along with it that that can feel scarier than just i don't know your local landlord lives in the castle and you know you just have to deal with him you don't have to worry about a giant army coming to back back up the power of the state um so yeah this is again where we lack sources to kind of burrow down and really get to know people's lives we have to kind of use our imagination and, and fill in the gaps um i remember uh, there was one point in your uh, narrative I and mean, now it's God, so long ago but the the uh, one of the emperors that came after irene mm. and he was you kind of just described him as just this incredible bureaucratic reformer uh, mm. that, you know just just modernized the tax code did all yes. of these wonders to make the machinery of Byzantium work for the next like few hundred years. And yeah. uh, you always say that his war with Bulgaria was like a real wasted opportunity. Do mm. you still think that now when you go through all of the Byzantine era, is there like one point that really sticks out where you think, I wish I could see an alternate universe where that didn't happen? Yeah. Definitely. Um, I mean, that's one of them, but even more is the transition after Justinian dies. Um, so Justinian um, goes to war with the Sassanids, the, the Persians, on the Eastern Front. And, and this is one of those interesting things about the modern world. You know, when, when Islamic State was running wild, they were moving back and forth across the desert between Syria and Iraq. And that desert was the front line between Roman and Sassanid Persia. And Justinian, you know, reached a point where he was like, I'm willing to pay them huge amounts of money, like, you know, half the tax revenue from a year or whatever, to just get peace, because this war is just going on forever. And every time one side gets a victory, the other side feels they have to continue the war to get the PR back in their favor. And um, <clears throat> when Justinian dies, his successor restarts the war immediately, mm. in part because of that feeling of like we're paying for we peace that's dishonorable yeah and that war leads to heraclius and then the the rise of islam basically mm. so that to me is the big what if if that war doesn't happen and you know let's say muhammad 
comes along and preaches a kind of Arab unity. What what happens next? Because, um, you know, again, we you may not want to get too much into the origins of Islam, but most religious founders um, can't imagine what the religion is going to look like after they die. Because obviously they're preaching for the conditions that exist. They're trying to convince people, you know, we need to get right with God. We need to do things better. So, you know, Islam is kind of formed after these Arab armies have conquered like the whole world. And it's like, wow, like this is, this religion is, is real. This is really powerful. Well, if they run into a Roman Sasanid border that's at peace and there are big armies going, you know, what do you want? Like, you know, we can, we can block you from expanding. I don't know what, you know, that's the biggest what if of all, I think. Um, that is a huge what if. Yeah. That is massive. You're right. Hmm. Completely forgot so, about that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, so, sorry. I mean, that's, yeah. So that's the, that's, no, I mean, that's the biggest what if of all. And obviously people don't want to talk about it because it implies that religion is a, is a human made thing that can be stopped or started and, you know, um you'd have a similar thing if you were talking about what if the romans did not adopt christianity you know what if there was a determined attempt to to wipe it out um but the what you were talking about is nicephorus the first um who came after irene and and was killed by crom and had his skull turned into a drinking cup uh so we're told and i think the the question there is whether had the bulgarian state or, you know, the Bulgar state, as it was at the time, if, if that had been destroyed, could the people of the Eastern Balkans have identified themselves with Constantinople? Um, because what, what the Romans in the earlier period were very good at doing was sort of planting colonies um, amidst other peoples and sort of converting them into becoming Romans. Um, and... The Byzantines didn't do that. There was a kind of arrogant sense of, no, you are other and you can't be us. And I just wonder if um, they had stopped the Bulgarians early, whether there could have been more Romans in the Balkans, because obviously what happens in the Balkans is you get Bulgarians, Croatians, Serbians, and so on. You get the whole modern world. And once those nations have their own sense of identity, that they are not Romans, then you you have a situ, you know you have a bad situation basically because you are you are then the colonial oppressor for when you are taking them over as opposed to saying you can be Roman you can be a part of you know Constantinople civilization so yeah mm. I think that's a turning point but it's difficult to say what would have happened mm, 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 mm. and I remember once you talking about uh, your top five emperors and this mm. was years ago. Mm. Is number one still the same? Yeah, so the, the emperor before uh, Justinian and, and Justin, uh, the, you know, famous takeover was Anastasius, who I don't know. I don't know if I'd still say he was number one. W- what struck me at the time was how much wiser he was than Justinian, that he, he was very much a preserve the good things we've got um, type of emperor. And he, so he made very sensible decisions, very sensible uh, financial decisions, very sensible military decisions. And he preserved peace for 20 years. So I thought that was quite impressive. I think probably when I finish the podcast and go through, I'm not sure his record will stand up to, to Heraclius or Basil II, um, or even maybe Alexius Komnenos, someone who had to deal with a com- really complicated situation, which you're about to come to. Uh, with the first crusade and and did some really impressive innovative things and that's you know quite different from anastasia sort of keeping things the status quo so true yeah true yeah it's it's always tough i i i take it very seriously obviously comparing emperors and it is very difficult to compare across the eras yeah especially when you've got a millennium worth of them mm. what about just got to ask uh, do you know anything yet about Constantine the Eleventh? I'm assuming you obviously do know something, but like, do you know enough to give a commentary of it? Um, no, I don't know enough to give a commentary. Uh, I'm guessing he did the best he could, and there was not there was nothing he could not do. Not a lot he I couldn't mean, do. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean the city was surrounded at that point, and the the path to restoring Byzantium was no longer open. You know, there, mm. it. Mm. 
you did just survived a bit longer, but eventually it would have fallen by that point. Yep. And do you think uh, the fact that the, the empire lasted for about a thousand years, what do you think was like the driving factor of that? Do you think it was just the fact that the citizens kind of bought into the fact that they were part of this empire? Or do you think it was just dumb luck? <laughs> uh, I think um, I think a lot of it is just the physical facts of Istanbul, you know, the Constantinople, where the city is, that it's hard to get to, it's hard to capture, and these big Roman walls um, prevented people from coming. And one of those imponderables in history is how many people thought about causing problem for the Romans and then decided not to because of the empire's reputation or because of how strong those defenses were. So I, I, I think that kind of impregnable city encouraged people to invest in the empire as an ongoing concern. And when you can't even fathom how long it's been there, I think that exerted a real power on people. Yeah. Um, it, uh, someone wrote a really good article or it came up in an article about, you know, we, because we think in terms of dates, we have a real clear sense of history and how long things have been around and so on. And they kind of pointed out that, you know, the Byzantines, you know, the particularly ordinary people was only a very, very small fragment of people who read history books and looked at the dates and sort of figured out, okay, that's how long ago Trajan was. That's how long ago Julius Caesar was. So to, to the ordinary people living in, in Byzantium, someone like Jesus and someone like Noah uh, probably, you know, didn't seem that long ago. Like, oh, they were a few hundred years ago, uh, but I, yeah. people's sense of time was kind of hazy. So to yeah. them, it probably seemed like, you know, Constantinople has been here forever. You know, it's like, um, it, and it always will be here forever. And that's a mindset we can't really get into because we can go, well, in 1066, this happened in England. And then in, you know, in 1800 this happened in australia and it's like we have this very clear sense of it and so yeah i i do think a lot of people just thought constantinople has been here forever it will be here forever it's the natural home of government for people in this area so why why even question it um, yeah 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 that yeah. is that is something else that you do particularly well i've got to say that you keep reminding people of like the, the general mindset of what the average person was back then must have been so profoundly different. Like it, it just, I always, now I always think about it. It's just like if my brain was just supplanted into some like fishmonger down at the, I don't know, the, the ocean or whatever. Mm. Like I, re I reckon I'd freak out. You may as well just put my brain in a monkey. Like it'd, it'd, be, it'd be that foreign from what your experience is. And that's yeah. so cool that you keep doing that. You keep reminding people like they, they thought about the world completely. And it's not just the hindsight thing. It's also the fact that like the, the way that they interpreted religion and, and like, you know, where they lived and all this kind of stuff, it meant completely different things. It's, it's a true testament to the podcast that you've done that. <laughs> uh, you're very kind. I mean, that's just, that's always what strikes me as so interesting. Um, that pe human nature, I don't think really changes much. I think people, you know, wake up in the morning and they're hungry and they want to find love and blah, blah, blah. But their sense of knowledge changes beyond all recognition. Um, and, you know, one of them, you know, in a way you kind of study like the statues in Constantinople or, you know, the, the giant columns and, and you work out when they were built. And that's all interesting. But in a way more interesting is when you read a tourist from 1300 and they write down what the local tour guide told them the column was that and it's complete mean. yeah it's complete nonsense like it's completely no. made up by the yeah <laughs> so the local tour guide has not made it they've come up with ideas because they've completely forgotten what the original purpose of the column was yeah <laughs> um, but that's just one of the most interesting things that there's these carved columns like you can see in rome with images on them from uh you know theodosius's gothic campaigns in the 300s and someone's looking at them a thousand years later and they have no memory of that whatsoever so they're saying well you know people talk all the time about what it means and what it is 
and no one's got a clue and so they just make up their own ideas and that's just endlessly fascinating you know yeah. um so yeah but when we get glimpses of that i'm always like that's the most interesting thing to me so that's what goes in the podcast i guess maybe that's what's coming across when you're listening to the podcast it's it's like it, the other thing that you do very well is uh you, you can tell when you're passionate about a point mm. and then that like really gets you out of uh having a micro sleep in long australian roads <laughs> where you probably saved me from crashing into a tree. <laughs> well, I, again, that's, that's very great. It's really nice to hear. And I would definitely say that comes from my dad because he was very like that. And my wife makes fun of me all the time when I'm being very like my dad because he was very actorly. <laughs> so he would do that. He would emphasize his emotional interest in something, you know. And so I do do that on the podcast. And I, I'm really glad it comes across well because obviously that's what I'm trying to do is, is to say, isn't this really interesting this this bit um uh yeah and uh i don't know i did you know i didn't i'm not trained in that but it just does i think i'm imitating him and his way of doing it so yeah yeah that's it's what's really kind of that's mm. that's the kind of thing that i got at the just i don't know maybe the hundredth episode mark it was just like kind of like usain bolt in that sense it's kind of like you're doing <laughs> exactly what you're supposed to be doing Ah. You know, like I feel like no one else should have been doing the history of Byzantium. It really <laughs> does feel like you were kind of like the fulcrum between all of these dusty old academics that just write like, <laughs> you know, like, I mean. Really, that's very kind of you. Um, no, I really, able I really to appreciate modernize it. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, I really appreciate that. And I think one of the hardest things for academics to do is to remember what they didn't know before they started studying. So whenever I interview academics, I do say, try to imagine the audience knows nothing, um, which I, they find really difficult, I think, because well, why would they be listening to a Byzantine history podcast? And I, and I always, I try to explain, it's not that they don't know anything, but it's if you assume they'll know what these, this place and this person, and then you move on and they're going, wait, who was that? And where was that? you've lost them. And I think they really struggle to remember that. And I think that is the joy of podcasting that you can go, let me remind you of that bit you really liked from three years ago. That's, that's coming back now to relevance. And I just think you can't do that in a book. You can't do that in an academic paper. It's much, much harder. So I really appreciate that. And I really, I, I that is a very high compliment because I do love what I do. And there, obviously there are bits about a job like you may find like when you come to editing something or whatever where you're like oh I, I don't want to hear myself talking again and you know that the, there are dull parts of the job but obviously I feel very lucky when I'm just reading and writing and and loving you it. still edit mm, yeah why haven't you shipped that off to a third world country <laughs> on fiber um That's insane. I mean <laughs> because I feel like I would then have to re-listen to the entire thing to make sure they hadn't made mistakes. And yeah, I'm just yeah. like, I can do it once. I mean, obviously it's very simple editing. If it became com more complicated, I would ask, I would get someone to help me. But I, yeah, I struggle. It's that terrible thing, you know, you found it really interesting to read. You found it pretty interesting to write about. And then when you have to hear it, you're just like, no, this, I've had the same line done. go around yeah. nine times. So I just don't want to hear someone else has edited it wrong have to tell them to edit it right then listen to it again and i'm just like oh god so yeah it is really <laughs> like a you, you do give up a lot when you give up editing i actually do mm. fully understand why you would want to keep it all together especially as you mentioned before that's that's the brilliance of what you've done i think it's just like i've never seen somebody that's just able to talk and it just be engaging like, I just feel like in the age of, like, TikTok, it's just, like, unless you have, like, I don't know, just, like, five seconds of LMFAO playing <laughs> while you're speaking, like, you've just lost people. That's always my fear as an internet creator. So I'm just always jamming everything with sound effects, <laughs> yeah, like, stupid meme pictures and things. And it's just incredible yeah. that there's just this, like, uh, yeah, just this old school audio book that is better than Lord of the Rings, better than like, you know, <laughs> Game of Thrones and all that kind of stuff by a mile. This is the other thing that's amazing about all of the fantasy ones. It's, it's just like, it's like, dude, it's not as good. It's not as good. 
The actual yeah. fantasy world that it's based off of all the castles and princesses is way better. Yeah, the history is always, there's always something, it's always happened once in history, something insane. Um, yes. Yeah, that's, that's, it's interesting because I would say I get a lot of, a lot, a, a lot less uh, social media interaction than other podcasts that are similar. Yeah. Uh, which I think, yeah, and I think that's in part what you're saying that I'm I'm uh, grabbing people who are less into that kind of TikTokization of things. Mm. Um, so uh, you know, people will write to me going, "I've been listening for seven years," and so they've never commented on anything, they've never messaged before. You know, I, I myself, obviously, I grew up before the internet, so I'm not really. You know, I've got I got into that, like, oh, I'm gonna comment on this and I'm gonna change people's minds. And then quickly you realize you're not changing anybody's mind. <laughs> like <laughs> you're just you're just you're just shouting yeah. into the wind and like <laughs> so I just gave up. But obviously, if you've grown up with the internet, you don't know any other way and you think this is this is the way to engage. So yeah, I, I'm clearly attracting people who feel like they don't they're not bothered by that. Yeah, um, actually, look. Look, yes, the product that you are producing would, I suppose, create that kind of person. It is still a testament to the fact that you just were able to make that engaging. Now I'm just kind of wondering, like, I guess we'll just wrap up fairly quickly, but what are you going to do with your life once it's done? <laughs> There's going to be a point where you've just read every book, right? Right. Well, I mean, you can't you know, go I, out and dig up an old <laughs> bloody monastery. <can> you? <laughs> well, that would be that would be the dream. Um, yeah, I mean, there are rabbit holes I'd love to go down. I, it, it's always a challenge because I think there's a whatever five percent, ten percent of the audience who quite like hearing about something random and, and daily life little segment, and ninety ninety five percent of people just want the story, just want the next battle and don't really care about that. So there are, there are, just rabbit holes sorry, I, just, I just got to say the fact that you're mm. always apologizing from going, <laughs> I'm just like, what, what are all these ingrates? You know, like you're all, as you said, yeah. you're always going down these like really cool little pathways and like just adding like way more context. I really don't understand all of the, uh, the whining, I suppose. I mean, I probably listen to it too much, but obviously people are used to podcasts being weekly and being, on time and obviously people are very understanding but i think there are lots of people who are like i don't care about i just want the story why is this not finished already and i you know i understand both points of view um most people are, are very very nice uh <laughs> um but yeah what am i going to do next like so there are rabbit holes i could go down more byzantium i could say well i'm going to write a book and just you know there are so many emperor stories we've been through that would make a good book i would love byzantium to be turned into a tv show or a film yeah. you know yeah could i help produce you know just be a part of getting an idea pitched to someone um but you know you you've been extremely kind uh to me and i you know people who like what i do often are which suggests to me that i probably should keep podcasting that this is a format that suits uh my brain you are a natural and so, yeah you, yeah you're very kind but that's so the <laughs> it's, it's it's tricky because i do think the romans are unique for people whose origins are from western europe or or central you know the whole mediterranean area because you can kind of see the romans as your ancestors and i think people say to me why don't you do a history of albania armenia you know whatever and i always think well yeah but no one will listen to that like you know people will give it a chance because it's me but then they'll go yeah i don't care about them they're not my they're not my roots they're not they're nothing to do with me i think that emotional connection would be missing mm, um mm, mm. and the the obvious thing to do is to go back to the earlier roman period but i think there's a balance there where people are like well i know this story back to front so i'd kind of only be doing the the pathways so the the side stories and i don't know if people would they'd go i don't care you know, so what I think, you know what I think? Yeah. Trisabon, mm. That's going to yeah. help you out with like two episodes. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> before, before it gets squashed as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there are, there are options. I'm open to suggestions. 
I think that that's definitely the one that you should be going down. I always thought that uh, while listening to it. I was just like, Jesus, just turn it into a Netflix show. Come on. Like, mm. It's all there. It's yeah. all there. You've outlined the entire thing. All you need mm. now is just uh, Chris Hemsworth. And then you're done. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's all, it's, it's, it's fine. It's finished. Yeah. So I, I really hope come. that that happens for you, man. Like, mm. honestly, I really do. I think it would just be a stellar show. I think it actually would be up there with Game of Thrones. Because remember that mm. HBO show, Rome? And then mm. I guess they kind of just cut its budget because I don't know why. I can't remember why, but I just remember it being like yeah. quite popular. And they said it was like too expensive to run or something. Yeah. That was incredible. That was a great yeah. show. That was a great show. And they, what I really liked about that was that they had the two, you know, ordinary guys at the center of the story because mm. i i don't think you need to make a history show where you just do the history exactly as it happened because sometimes that is unrelatable and you kind of know where it's going and you're not yeah. involved and yeah. i think by giving it that forrest gump thing you know here's the ordinary person living through history you can make a better television show so yeah way better I, especially like yeah. it's just the most captivating thing you've ever done i'm sure you hear it all the time but that one that you describe the life of like some grunt soldier on the the front line of like you know the, the yeah. front line of the, the, the whatever the mountains are called right um, yes absolutely yeah that that right there Just that guy's <laughs> life show done yeah right yeah i would you know Mm. I think that I'm, I I think that would that's a really fascinating period that just isn't known about and would make for great TV. Yes. So yeah, yes, definitely. I think mm. the same thing too. Um, your big inspiration for it because like my previous stand up show was about uh, Caesar. Now mm. I'm going to do one about the Byzantine Empire. I'm like Jesus, talk about niche subject. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just think that they're just like very. I don't know, because like my entire job is politics, right? Mm. And I really feel like when you contextualize that into history, it's, it, 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 man, it, it gives you a lot of like red pill moments where you're kind of just mm. like, it's all, it's all happened before, like over and over again. And so that, yeah. anyway, so like I'm doing that. I put huge credit to the fact that you were just able to keep the podcast so engaging that I was able to just, it's pathetic. I feel like I'm in year 11 again. Like I'm doing homework. <laughs> I'm reading up with the periods where it's going along. It's, it's, it's really like occupied a huge, a, a part, an, a, an amount of time of my life that I am ashamed to admit, you know, like it's, it's so much of it. It's yeah. It's, it's like all credit to you for just being able to um, animate something that I actually do think is like understated in how important it actually is. So like the, yeah. the story of Western civilization, I suppose. Yeah. And yeah, Absolutely. you've done that and uh, all credit to you and uh, best of luck. Hope you get a movie deal. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for such a, a kind, lovely interview. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. It, uh, honestly, usually I just say this just to humor the person that I'm interviewing. But in this instance, I truly mean you deserve it um yeah so <laughs> take that thank you so much and best of luck with all your work no worries thank you robert I'm from